Are you ready? See you red. It's time for another episode of Fireside Chat. On the eve of the Edmonton coaching change, we're back to talk about an interesting week in Flames hockey. As usual, it's Dan and Matt. How you doing, Matt? Good, as always. And we're joined tonight by another member of the Fireside Chat team who you guys don't get to hear from. We're with Mike Crosby tonight. Mike is uh, our editor and one of our producers on the show. How you doing, Mike? Good. Hey, guys. Happy to be here. Mike came on with us tonight to uh, discuss Flames stuff. Uh, he's one half of our editing team, and Mike... We would not be able to do this show without you. So thanks for everything you do on the uh, on the back end. You're kind of our unsung hero. Thank you. We should also give props to your uh, co-editor, Brett Bauer. And the two of you make a great team. Thanks. So let's jump right into it, guys. Um, a bit of a different week for us this week. Usually we've been singing the praises of the Flames. And this right now we're coming off a five-game losing streak. Um why don't we start with our guest, Mike? What are your thoughts right now? Um, yeah, I kind of wish I was joining you under better circumstances here. Uh, although the games that I did watch, I didn't catch all of them, but it seemed like we were close and we were in every single game. So there were a lot of moral victories there. Unfortunately, moral victories don't really show up in the standings. What I would chalk it up to, I think, is a lot of the veterans are coming back from injury, and I think they need some time to get back into the swing of things. There's been a lot of changes to the lines because of that, so guys are playing with you know different guys than they're used to, but I agree with what you're saying about playing well. Um, if you look at the scores, we didn't get blown out. I mean, we were losing by one, two goals in each one, so to me, I don't know what you think, Matt, but to me, the Flames were showing they can play to the level of some of these elite teams in the NHL. They just need to up their game a little bit. What do you think, Matt? Yeah, and with the games, especially the ones against Pittsburgh and Chicago, they were in it for most of the game. And if they would have got a good bounce here and there, the storyline's likely different. Unfortunately, uh, we lost five games in a row, but how would you say it doesn't feel like an actual five-game losing streak? If that makes sense. Yeah, well, and even if you look at the games, like the one against the Maple Leafs where we lost um, 4-1, to one, I mean, that game should really be a 2-1 to one loss. They got two empty netters at the end, so that doesn't tell the whole story. But, yeah, I agree with you about it not feeling like a losing streak. I was watching all these games, and right till the end in most of them, you kept thinking, we can come back, we can do this, we can do this. So they were still really intense games. There's none that I just turned off halfway through, like some of the ones last year, and said, eh, I'm done. I don't need to watch this anymore. Yeah, and there were some games in last month where likely we shouldn't have won. So we're kind of balancing that all out from last month. Like, especially uh, those last-minute comeback games in the middle of last month. You know, we should have likely lost those ones, so... Well, I think that's the nice thing about where we are right now, is we have enough points occurred that we probably didn't think we have that we can go on a week like this and still be fairly high in the standings we have i guess a safety net to drop down through well they did just fall out of the playoff spot though true but i i think that they can easily get back into it but it's not like we've fallen to 15th yeah we're only a couple points out of a playoff spot right now mike what do you uh what do you think was besides the uh the line combinations maybe changing do you, what do you think Hartley can use with his staff to make this road trip teachable? What do you think they can do or change before the next game to try and get back on track? Well, I think he should be reinforcing the point that they did play well in, in all of those games. The one thing that I've been noticing that I'd like to see more of is some truculence. Uh, like Latang going after Goudreau in the Pittsburgh game, and there weren't really any consequences for That's him. That's true. So I think actually that would be nice uh, getting Potter into the lineup. Just tell him an angle and to start hitting everything that moves. Potter will add some toughness. We still have McGratton who we can always draw back in the lineup at any time too if we want some more toughness. Yeah, but other teams need to be afraid to play us. What do you think, Matt? Do you think that'll help us? Well, it couldn't hurt. Uh, in that Buffalo game, we saw the Bullig. No, it was the Pittsburgh game. My mistake. Uh, Bullig. Uh, after Smeed got hit, he attempted to fight Deprez, and uh, yeah, that was kind of embarrassing for everybody. So, I don't know, maybe they need to actually drop the gloves instead of, you know, tripping the guy? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, well, and that's one thing we haven't seen from the Flames a lot this year is fighting. And I, I think that you're right about the truculence, Mike. I think a little bit more truculence, maybe a little bit more fighting at key moments. We've seen in the past that that can help bring a team around and change the momentum. So maybe that's something that the Flames need to be adding back into their arsenal. Yeah, I, I'm not sure about you guys. Like, I haven't seen every single game, but I don't think I've seen McGratton fight yet this year. I've seen he Bowen has fight. Him. I saw Anglin fight. Yeah, he's on the team for one reason, so step that up. Well, the thing is, is that in, across the NHL, fighting is down significantly, especially with uh, everybody mandating visors and uh, needing, you like, you can't take off your helmet before a fight. So, I don't know if, like, everybody's seeming to be reticent to actually drop them now. Yeah, I don't know. I, I don't think we should be as afraid of suspensions. We've got three tough guys on the team, and try and start some stuff and if you know if McGratton or Bola get suspended a couple of games it's not the end of the world we have guys that can slot into that position well I was going to say especially a guy like uh, McGratton who's not playing anyways if he goes out there and gets suspended I mean it's not like we're probably going to miss him a ton because he hasn't been part of the team and a big contributor so far yeah I don't know if either of you guys listened to Brad Trilliving on the radio today um, he did an interview with Fan960 and he pointed out this is not really a time to panic. It's five games. Yes, it's bad, but we expected this to happen. I mean, we we expected the Flames were going to go through a hard time at some period, and we've been very fortunate with the great start that we've had. Do you guys think, we'll start with Mike, do you guys think that this is a epidemic and this team is doomed to the same kind of result from here on in, or do you think they can pick it up and start winning again? You know, at the beginning of the year, this is sort of the hockey I was expecting to see. Just us going out fighting hard, but not winning games. I think we have a better team than that now. We're doing stuff right, and hopefully we can put it together and get back into the win column. But yeah, I don't think this is going to be a problem with the team all year. I think you'll see us start to turn it around in the next week or two here, hopefully. What about you, Matt? Well, one of the problems over the next... Uh, 50 games is that 37 of those games are against teams that are either better than the Flames in the standings or teams like Dallas, Colorado, Minnesota, Boston, and the Rangers. So, you know, we're not going to be facing a lot of easy competition. So could the Flames fall off a cliff? It's possible, especially with playing mostly good teams. Could they rebound? That's also possible. It's pretty much all up to them and how they respond. I think one thing to remember, too, is coming into this season, we were expecting this team to be horrible. Like, we were not expecting much at all from this group. And even Matt and I said, prepare for another terrible year. So I think what we've had so far has been a pleasant surprise. But I agree with what you're saying, Matt. We have a lot of hard games coming up. And I think if we can at least stay competitive in them, that's going to help with a winning attitude here in, in Calgary for these young players. But, yeah, I, I don't want to say we're going to lose them all from here on out because obviously we're not. But I wouldn't be surprised if the losses start to mount from here. Well, a thing to consider also is that the Flames have played 13 games against easy teams thus far. And in the next 50 games, they only play 13 more. So, you know, we might have gone through the easy portion of the schedule already. And... We have had a fairly easy schedule so far. Yeah, yeah. but uh, I think we do tend to pick it up against tougher competition. Like watching the Chicago game, watching the Pittsburgh game, we played really hard in those games. The Anaheim game where we came back and beat them. The Chicago game where Hiller was insane the beginning of the year. Uh I don't think that is necessarily a problem for us. Oh, no. It, it's just that I don't know if they have it enough there to consistently beat them. Like, they might get a, a handful of wins, but I don't know if like they can get enough to actually propel them into a playoff spot. Yep, yeah, fair enough. And, and I think, you know, we've been very cautious on the show so far to be cognizant that this team may not be a playoff team. So even if they don't make the playoffs, I think playoffs would be a, a fantastic kind of Cinderella end of the season. But I would be okay if we're seeing them playing hard, staying within one or two goals of each um, of each team that we play, and having these guys learn a lot, even if we fall short of the postseason. 
Yeah, exactly. Like, if we win, that's a positive. If we lose, well, there's positives to take from that. So... What do you think, Mike? Is it postseason or bust this year? Uh, no, I don't think so. I think uh, the fans are going to have a little more uh, faith. And, uh, yeah, if, if we do fall short of the playoffs, I don't think that's going to be a massive disappointment to people. It would be amazing if we did make the playoffs. But uh, we are in year two of a rebuild. There's still a long way to go from here. And as you guys are so fond of saying, we haven't even seen Sam Bennett in a Flames jersey yet. So that should happen next year, hopefully. And one good thing to look forward to at the draft table is that there are 10 guys that are as good as Sam Bennett in this draft. It oh, is yeah. absolutely nuts. So if we do miss the playoffs and we squeak into the top 10, we're going to get another really dynamite player. Yeah, and, you know, I think that in some ways, I think, it, you know, we were expecting nothing here. And even if we fall two or three points short of the playoffs, some people are going to say, well, we could have tanked and got Eichel or Hannafin or McDavid. But if you look at the rebuilding teams out there, we need the winning attitude. And I think I would rather almost give up the chance. Matt and I have talked about this, but I'd rather give up the chance to get one of those guys and show that we can do this. We can win. We can bring in young players and rack up a lot of points. And to me, if we can get within, you know, 10 points of the playoffs, well, then next year we're, we've shown, hey, we can do this. So next year we have to do better, you know, and that's a challenge for the players. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, build a team where everyone's proud to win and they're going to fight hard every single game. Be the anti Edmonton Oilers. Yep. Pretty much. I mean, if we can make it even within 10 points of the playoffs, um, in the second year of the rebuild, think of where we could be in year five of this rebuild. The year that we're supposed to be coming out and challenging for a playoff spot. And I think, in a way, us getting to the playoffs this year is going to put pressure on this team that maybe they don't need at this point. I think knowing the city and seeing what we saw in 04, if we make the playoffs, we're going to expect to do it every year after that. And if we don't, it's going to be seen as a failure. Yeah, and we've seen like with teams like Colorado and Ottawa that in recent years where they thought they were better than what they were, made moves accordingly, and then kind of fell flat on their face. Yeah, that's the one thing I'm afraid of is expecting a playoff team every single year based on the performance of the first couple months and building towards that and giving up some really good assets that we might have needed down the road. Well, I think that's an important part, too. I think at some point, True Living would be pressured into saying, okay, this team's expected to be a playoff team, so I'm going to have to build that. I think in a lot of the ways that we saw the Flames do that after 04, where they were expected to be a playoff team, and we saw them trying to bring in that caliber talent, and it just never worked. Yeah, it basically became like the New York Rangers of the early 2000s, where, like, bring in the star talent, then hope they do something like Tony Amante, and yeah, that worked. To me, I'd rather fall short of the playoffs, say, hey, look, we can do this. We made it, you know, within 10, 5, 3, whatever points. We'll build on that from next year, but look, we're on the upward trajectory. We're not drafting in the top 5 this year. Well, even if they do slide all the way into a top 5 pick, as unlikely as it would be, uh, that's still not the end of the world because they will be able to take lessons of, okay, what were they doing successfully in the first couple of months? Okay, how can we stretch that out over the course of a full season? You have to remember that guys like uh, Gaudreau and Juris and several others that are on the farm, like, they're college guys, and, like, they're still not used to playing an 82-game schedule, so they could easily hit the wall. Yeah. And, you know, I'm always, when I'm looking at these games, I'm always looking at what are we seeing from these games that is good, even though, you know, like we've talked about, we've had um, a couple times that we've maybe not won, but we've seen a lot of good things. Tell me what you guys think, but to me, I think this road trip we just went on has really been the emergence of Marcus Granlin for me. I think he was the best forward on this trip. What do you think, Mike? Yeah, I've actually been really impressed with Granlund ever since we saw him last year in his call-up. Uh, he's a really solid player, and I, yeah, I see him being on this team full-time. Matt, what do you think of him? I agree wholeheartedly. Back uh, when I first saw him live uh, was in 2013, and his skating was a little weak, but I recall saying that if he could figure that out, like he would be a real dynamite player, and he has, so... 
I could easily see him being a full-time top six forward moving through the whole rebuild. Josh Juris was the first guy who was a call-up to apparently be told to get a house in Calgary, find a permanent residence here. Do you guys think the Grandland's next? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. And, and, you know, I think the Grandland will probably stay here for a while because as of right now, Michael Backlund, who's the center of these filling in for, is really nowhere in sight as far as uh, being ready to come back. So I think by the time Backlund is ready to return, Granlin will have probably already cemented a roster spot here. Not saying we're going to get rid of Backlund, but I think Granlin's playing so well and he keeps earning more chances that he's going to just end up sticking around all year. Well, you got to remember we're going to be closing in on the trade deadline by the time Backlund returns. So if That's necessary, true. you could always trade off a surplus forward to keep Granlund around. Well, and at that point, too, after the trade deadline, there is no upper limit to the number of guys in your roster. True. So we can carry as many as we want to. Yeah, I was thinking, with all the center depth we have, um, I'm not sure Granlin sticks at center. What I see happening is because he's got the skill set to be a top six player, I would shift him onto the wing. I'd actually want to see him playing with Monaghan Glencross and move Jones down to the third line. Yeah, that wouldn't be a bad idea. Uh, especially uh, what considering we got... Bennett coming up and Jankowski in the pool still. Yeah. You know, we have so many centers after 20 years of none. (laughs) (laughs) What a great problem to have, isn't it? Yeah. How many GMs around the league would like to sit around and go, crap, I have too many centers. What do I do about this problem? (laughs) Can you imagine being kept up at night? What's what's the problem? I have too many centermen. (laughs) That are all good and should all be playing in the NHL. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I, I agree with you, Mike. I can see him being shifted to another position. I'm still, and we've talked about this before, I'm still not sure that Glenn Cross is going to be a flame come trade deadline day. So maybe we see Granlin slot into that wing position that um, Glenn Cross currently has. Yeah, possibly. And I think any time you can take a center and get them versatile on the wing, sort of like Colborne is a winger center, it just gives you so many more options for line combinations, for special teams, to cover injury. So I think the more we can do that, which we've seen the Flames doing over the last little bit, even Juris has been playing both wing and center. Um, you know, it, it can do nothing but good. Yeah, I just, we have enough centers, we could build a whole line of all centers and then not have to worry about face-offs. Well, at least as much. Careful, that's what the Oilers have done. <laughs> Uh-oh. Yeah, no, we don't want to do that then. But yeah, no, you're right. If you can get wingers that can take the face-off, you're not going to be as worried about uh, getting your centermen kicked out. Mm. Oh, did you know that they actually changed the rules on icings that if you get kicked out, you actually stay in? Huh? Yeah. What? They they don't wave the center anymore on icings. If the defensive center gets kicked out, he just gets an on-paper kick out, and he's, the puck gets dropped. But I imagine after so many times they'd kick him out. I mean, you could use that to no. delay the game then. No, it's... Well, the second time you would get a delay a game penalty. It's just so, like, they don't uh, do that. Like, they'll... Sometimes, like, teams would have a winger take the draw just to get kicked out. Yeah. To buy a few seconds, but they changed that. Huh, when did they change that? Ah, this year. I just saw it the other day happen and going, okay, I didn't know that was a thing, so... Yeah, I didn't know that either. Interesting. Well, guys, we've talked about some of the call-up forwards, and we've been talking about them all year, but we finally have the Flames' first call-up on defense. Uh, Laddie Schmid is out with an upper body injury, and according to Coach Hartley, he's expected to be out for some time. They haven't given a definite timeline, but he'll be out for a while. And the Flames called up Corey Potter. Anybody surprised that's the first defensive call-up? Not really. Mike? Yeah, no, not at all. <laughs> I think, you know, some people thought it might be Watherspoon, but this is a veteran guy who was really brought in to be that last centerman, I believe lost the job to Diaz in training camp. So, yeah, I'm not surprised he's here now. Yeah. Yeah, and Smead's likely out probably for a couple of weeks with a concussion because that hit. I still don't understand how that didn't get a suspension or a penalty or anything. Yeah, that was a Do we know hit. if Toronto's reviewing it? Uh, it would have been... He would have been suspended by now, so, yeah. So for those that aren't familiar with Corey Potter, he's a 30-year-old defenseman, uh, six foot three, 204 pounds, a right shot. He's played all over the NHL. He's spent time with the Rangers, the Penguins, the Oilers, and the Bruins, and we signed him as a free agent in the offseason. 
not a guy who's a very well-known defenseman, but I think a very capable 6-7. What do you think, Matt? Yeah, he's okay. He can be a little bit of an adventure in his own end, though. But for a guy who we need to cover for two weeks? Oh, no, it's not a problem for a short-term stopgap. It's just, like, don't expect him to wow you. (laughs) There's a reason why he's been in the AHL. The other thing, too, that's kind of interesting, if you look at the time on ice for the Flames pairing, the third pairing, the 5-6 defensemen, really have not been given a whole lot of time over the last uh, number of games. So the Flames probably aren't confident there. And I think this is going to let them mix some things up and try different defensemen in different positions. I think we're going to see a lot more ice time for uh, Diaz going forward. And I think that we may start... I mean, we're going to have seven defensemen now, so I think that they're going to want to rotate through more. I wouldn't be surprised to see England scratch a little bit more and try a Potter-Diaz pairing. What do you guys think? Yeah, that would make sense to me, although uh, Potter and Diaz are both right shots. Although, I guess England is too. Um, Yeah, Potter on paper strikes me as pretty similar to England. I get nervous every time that 5-6 pair is out on the ice, so I think we're still going to see the reduced ice time for that pairing. Yeah, that's uh, unfortunately for the Flames, they have really only four top four defensemen and then like number sevens for everybody else. Yeah, but and, and I mean that's what we expect from a rebuild. Oh yeah, yep. Not saying that's a problem in a rebuild. It's just you know it's a little dicey if you're actually trying to go for a playoff spot. And I think a lot of what they've probably done there is trying to give those six seven guys. A chance to show they're more than six, seven guys. Um, and to me, the only guy that I've seen that I really think might have a chance would be Diaz. Uh, he makes too many mistakes at the blue line. Uh, yeah, so... I, I agree with that. I think he could perhaps be coached into being a uh, five, six guy, but I don't know. Yeah, they're all kind of like placeholder guys in my view. They're okay, but you know. If you could find somebody better, do so. Yeah, that's. I was reasonably happy with Smeed as that 5-6 pair sort of shut down D-man, and I wouldn't mind having another guy like that who is fine in our end. We've got lots of offensively capable defensemen on the team. So if you guys look at the defensive pairings, do you think that part of the reason maybe that 5-6 is getting so little ice time is because we have such a great 1-2 pairing? If we didn't have... Brody Giordano playing as well as they did, do you think they'd be getting less ice time? I think you would be sheltering that third pairing as much as possible regardless. It's just, yeah, they're not really... Like, you wouldn't want to see them out against Taze and Kane, put it that way. No, No. for sure. (laughs) And I'm just looking here. Um, None of that... None of the defensemen are really locked up all that long. Smead and uh, England both have three years left in their deal. I'm okay keeping Smead around. Mm -hmm. England, I think, is going to become a bit of a liability by the end of his three years there left. Obviously, Brody's here for a while. Uh, Weidman's got three years. Gio's got two. So most of the defensive core is locked up short term. But, yeah, I get a little bit nervous knowing we've got uh, D- Derek England on the books for $2.9 million for three years. Well, all they need to do is go out and acquire a guy like Brent Seabrook or something through trade in the offseason. Yeah, and, and I guess with the salary room we have, we can probably afford to keep England for the next couple of years. Oh, yeah, that won't be a problem, but I think in the off season, especially as we're moving forward in the rebuild, that they'll need to target teams that have no cap room and see if you can't pick off a good, solid top four guy. Yeah, absolutely. Mike, who who would you like to see the Flames bring in here to solidify our defensive core? Um, you know what? I'm... I would. I'm gonna be optimistic here. I'd like to go after one of the defense prospects in Buffalo. I know they need help on forward, so I think Berchi might be an appealing guy for them. And I would really love to see if we could get either Ristolainen or Zadorov. You would need to trade Bennett for that. I was gonna say Ristolainen is gonna be a big return. I think. Yeah, yeah. Bennett plus probably. That's how good those two guys are. Unfortunately. Uh, actually, Buffalo's not a bad target. They have about seven or eight really good defensemen. 
a guy on their uh, farm team that I've watched because Adirondack plays Rochester so often is uh, Chad Rudwell. And uh, he's basically a lot like Chris Russell, but not in the NHL. And I think that's the kind of guy that we can take a flyer on. I mean, bring in a young guy like that and see how he develops. He is looking good. Um, it's not like he's a total unknown from the college ranks or something. And even if he doesn't become a top, you know, six guy in the NHL, I think he's still a good call-up guy. But, yeah, from what I've seen, he looks like he's on the upward swing as well. Yeah, it, it's one of those things that Buffalo has 10 tons of defensemen. We have 10 tons of forwards. So it could be a good fit to balance things out. For sure. The one guy that I wish the Flames would have gone after um, as a free agent was Matt Niskanen. Yeah, for what he signed for, though. Uh, for what he signed for, it wasn't worth it. Yeah, yeah you're right. that's the only problem I have. Like, I do like Niskanen a lot, but yeah, no. That contract is just the bear. Yeah, and I wouldn't have wanted that contract, but if we could have even offered him, because I think he's a good long-term investment, if we could have gone a little bit longer on the term, do you know how long his term is right now? I think it was a six-year, five-and-a-half okay. per yeah. or something like that. See, but even even a five-and-a-half, I mean, that's what we're paying Weidman. I wouldn't be opposed to five-and-a-half. Yeah, but uh, Treliving said he doesn't want to give out anything longer than a three-year contract, I think it is. So. Okay, yeah, I can see that. Yeah, I'm looking him up. He's under contract till 2021 for 5.75. So, yeah, no, I, I would be okay with that dollar value. I thought he was making more than that. But, yeah, if if he was looking for length, um, he's got a seven-year deal. That's a long deal. Yeah. And he's got modified no move on there too, which after seeing Sutter give out modified no moves, I shudder when I think about another flame having a modified no move. <laughs> Well, I mean, I don't think a modified no move is that big an issue when you're into year five or six of a deal with that much uh, dollar value on it. I think the cap hit's going to be the bigger problem there. When you're in year five or six, but when we're signing guys like, you know, Stajan had a modified no move. Like we're signing these guys to five, six year and you're looking going, crap, I don't want this guy here for five years potentially. And he's going to be hard to move because of it. Yeah. Well, if you can't move him because of his cap hit, the modified no move isn't really making a difference there. Yeah, yeah, I guess it, it all depends. I mean, we've seen some guys who probably could have been moved to better teams, but weren't because of a modified no move yeah. or a full no move, like you know, an Aginla, somebody like that. Yeah, and I think that's why we're gonna have a hard time if we want to move Glenn Cross out. Mm-hmm. Well, guys. Um... Interesting note with the Flames losing, just a bit of a note. Matt, maybe you can fill us in. I haven't been watching much this week, but the Flames are on a losing streak, but Adirondack has won five of their last six. Yeah, they've been quite impressive. They haven't been scoring as much lately, but they've been getting stellar goaltending from both Thiessen and Ordeo. And, and that's good to see, because Ordeo looks so bad at the beginning of the year, as he did last year, that he's finally coming around. Yeah, and Emile Poirier is going to be one hell of a player. Yep. He's basically Gaudreau on the farm. He is Every shift, he is the, noticeably dangerous every time. It's actually quite amazing, and he should be the next forward call-up. Yeah, absolutely. And that, that, I think, is awesome. I've seen him a little bit. I, I haven't seen much of the last six games. But from what I've seen of him over the last, I think I watched uh, one online that was three games ago. Yeah, it's great that he's able to kind of jump his way to the top of the depth chart. There's guys that if you look at the depth chart, we're probably above him. And he's fought his way all the way to the top, and that's awesome to see. Yeah, him, uh, Arnold, and Berchi have been the line uh, since uh, Sven got sent down. And like Sven's been good as well down there. That whole line's actually been clicking quite well. That sounds like a good line to me. Like, you could transplant that whole line back onto the flames and it wouldn't look too bad. Exactly. So, you know, I know a lot of people were worried when the Jerome McGinley and, um, and Jay Bomeister trades happened that we really didn't get enough back. But I think if anyone looks at Poirier and how he's coming, even Klimchuk and how he's coming... I think that we probably did better in that deal than it looked like on paper at first. Yeah, at least in the Bow Easter trade, for sure. Yeah. The Ginla trade, eh, not so much, but we'll see. Yeah, depends on how Morgan Klimchuk works out. Yeah, no, I guess that's true. But you also have to look at the fact that 
other teams that have traded big stars like Aginla, uh, they didn't get very much either. Yeah. Well, and even if you even if you go all the way back in Flames' history of trading big stars, we tend to not get a good return. I mean, you look at Doug Gilmore, even someone like Theron Fleury. We got a, we didn't get a very good return for Theo. Uh, so we this, got Regeer for Theo. So. Well, that's it. We got Regeer, but remember at the time, Regeer yeah, had two broken true. legs. He was a kid that they were throwing in because they didn't want him. He was a prospect that got in a he got an uh, I think a an accident with a snowmobile and had two broken legs. So the Flames didn't take him, thinking here's a prospect we can use. They probably took him because Colorado said take this kid or we're not going to make the trade. Yeah, we're throwing him in. Yeah, well that didn't turn out for us too badly in retrospect. Truce. I'd say we did all right with Joe Newendike too. Yeah, yeah. No, you're right. That was a good deal. But again, I think in that one, Jerome was a bit of a wild card. Yeah, we wanted Todd Harvey. <laughs> <laughs> Who we ended up getting later on. Todd Harvey did wear a flame jersey, I believe. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, no, we definitely got the better of that one. Yeah, I'd say if you look at the return on the Bowmeister trade, I think we come out on top there. Like, we got Poirier, we got uh, Russell, and we got uh, Barra, and R- we Russell turned him into Russell didn't come in that deal. Smith. Russell was already here. Russell came in the offseason for a fourth. We got Kandari. Oh, right. Shoot. Kandari yeah, and uh, <laughs> what the pick that eventually became Hunter Smith as yeah. well. Yeah. We, we got Red Obara and flipped that yeah. for the second. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, even if you look at that tr- that trade already with the goaltender getting flipped, I think that was a decent trade. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And really, Bullmeister took Russell's spot. So, uh, you know, uh, we got him because of that as yeah. well indirectly months <laughs> later <laughs> yeah right see i always i always forget who got moved in which of those deals because they happen so quickly i kind of look at it all in my mind as just one big deal yeah well it's it was like three like, days apart or something like that it, exactly it almost feels like we just shipped them all out in one deal and got all those guys back together and even when i think about the draft picks i sit and go okay who came from which deal because <laughs> they all they all kind of get jumbled in my head well, guys, um, speaking of Morgan Klimchuk, some bad news for Flames fans. He got cut from Team Canada's training camp this week. He actually got there late. There was some weather problems that he couldn't get to the first uh, practice, and he got let go, which I-, I guess was kind of to be expected. He hasn't had a great year so far, but that leaves only one Flames prospect in World Junior contention, and that's uh, Rushen Rafikov, who looks like he'll probably make uh, Team Russia, and I think will probably do fairly well there. I think he'll be the captain of Team Russia, actually. You think so? Yeah. So, Mike, if there's no flames on Team Canada, are you going to be watching the World Juniors as much as you might if there was a flame on Team Canada? You know, probably not, no. (laughs) I only watch the World Juniors if there's a prospect that I really want to see or, yeah, somebody from the flames. Is there somebody um, outside of the flames who you're looking forward to seeing? Well, it'll be interesting to see Connor McDavid, even though he's going to potentially one of our rivals. What about you, Matt? Is this going to keep you from watching as much World Juniors as you might have? Well, I'll be watching Russia rather intently just to see how Rafikov's doing. I saw a highlight the other day, and his slap shot reminded me a lot of Anton Babchuk's laser beam one-timer. So, you know, we'll see. I, I'll, the only I'll good be thing watching... Babchuk brought to the team was a shot. Yeah. yeah. It, Put it this way, if Rafikov has any speed to him and some semblance of knowing what he's doing defensively, then he'll be an NHL player because of that slap shot. As long as he wants to come to North America. That's the big he, question. He Mark. does. He wanted to come over, but he had a visa issue, I think, this year, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. and he, he wants to in July so because that visa issue is no longer a problem. And Rafikov, I think, is another good example of the Flames being able to do good things with late draft picks. He was a seventh-round pick in 2013, and we're starting to see him develop probably more than most people would expect from a seventh-round pick. Yeah, and plus he's not actually Russian nationality-wise. He's a Tatar, so, you know, that's a different thing entirely. So, might not have the same issue. Hopefully. Hopefully. If we look at that 2013 draft for the Flames, that was quite a good draft. I mean, we got Monahan, Poirier, Klimchuk, Kanzig, uh, Eric Roy, Tim Harrison, Rafikoff, and Gilmore. So if we look you know, at draft years that are going to help make up players that will probably be part of this rebuild, I think that might be one of the most significant. 
Yeah, the only player from that draft year that I could see the Flames not bothering to sign is Eric Roy, but everybody else has been quite good thus far. I haven't been following um, Providence as much this year. How's uh, John Gilmore looking? I He had the first star of the game last week. Uh, he, I do believe he had a goal and two assists, and he's starting to round into form. Good. That's awesome to hear. Um, any other topics you guys want to talk about on the plate for the Flames? Not really. Uh, no, I'm good. Well, then why don't we go up the road a little bit and discuss what's happened today in Edmonton. Um, for those that don't know... Edmonton saw their coach, Dallas Eakins, given the the boot. Um, he got fired today, and no surprise, Craig McTavish is back behind the bench. <laughs> M- Mike, as our guest, why don't we let you start? You can join our, our famous uh, Oilers discussion oh, yeah. this week. Oilers rant of the week, man. <laughs> I don't even know where to start. Like They're just imploding, and it's really – it's – alternatively sad and hilarious to watch. Yeah, I don't know what McTavish is doing. I guess Aikens had to go, but I don't think anything that they do is going to help that team short of trading out like Taylor Hall. And Matt, uh, Darren Drager had an interesting comment today about Taylor Hall. Do you want to let us know what that was? Yeah, he uh, said that Taylor Hall from a culture standpoint, not an on-ice standpoint, has not been what they thought he would be. And more or less was intimating that he's a bit of a problem in the locker room. So, yeah, they're looking to actually trade him between now and the deadline. Whether they get the return they're looking for is, you know, who knows. Well, that's an interesting discussion there. So now that that's out there, if you're another GM and you're hearing that he's bad in the room, do you think you're going to be as likely to want to bring him into your organization? Probably not. <laughs> what do you think, Mike? No, I don't think you'd be as likely to want to bring him in, but I think there's 28, 29 teams in the league that would still take a chance on him. I think maybe if he's not the guy, you might be able to knock some sense into him. Do you think it affects the asking price? Yeah, that's the thing. Like, it, you know, like, it, are you going to give the asking price of an 80 point forward, or, you know, oh God, this guy's a headache, you know? I'm only going to yeah. be willing to give away some assets that I don't really care about. If I'm a GM and I'm negotiating with McTavish for Hall, I'm probably saying, you know what? There's obviously some question marks here. I'm not going to pay you the price you'd probably want for a proven player because if he doesn't get along in the dressing room, now i got to find another buyer for him next year. So, yeah, I'd be knocking I'd be knocking value off right off the top. Well, mm-hmm. if you look at in history, uh, there's a similar left winger, uh, Alex Tangay. When he uh, got dealt from Colorado to Calgary, we only gave up uh, Jordan Leopold and a pair of second-round picks. Now, granted, Hall is a better player, but he's not that much better Whereas Taylor or Tangay, he scored a Stanley Cup winning goal, had a reputation of being a good defensive forward, this, that, the next thing, and a lot of the problems that Hall has. So maybe that level of a return is all that they might be able to get for Hall, which, you know, a top four defenseman and two lousy second round picks. I don't know. It's interesting you bring up Jordan Leopold because he's still around the league and he seems to get a trade every year. So maybe he'll end up in Edmonton as part of that trade. <laughs> maybe. Yeah, I could see them getting a uh, like an Aginla style return on Hall, like a, a late first rounder and a couple of okay prospects. I, yeah. I think if I was making that deal, I'd probably do a Brian Burke style deal where everything is conditional. Yeah, okay, I'll give I'll pay up if it works out. You know, if we make the playoffs or whatever, if he gets such and such a number of goals, fine, I'll give you an extra first. But I think if he gets moved, you'll see a what I think Brian Burke is most famous for, which is a deal where like half of what's coming back is all conditional on certain milestones being hit. Yeah. Well the problem is that Taylor Hall is just that bad defensively that even though he's an eighty point guy uh, you know, that's not the be-all and end-all. And, you know, he has a bit of a reputation for being pig-headed and not willing to listen to the coaching staff. So, you know, that's got to weigh heavily. <laughs> for sure. 
So we're we're talking about this before the show, and it was interesting. If you go back and listen to the Edmonton press conference today, some of the media were insinuating with um, Craig McTavish that why'd you fire the coach? You're the guy who gave him this crappy roster to work with. And I was saying to Mike and Matt, it would have been funny if he went, you know, you're right, and just got up and walked off the stage. Like I think you can only blame the coach so much in Edmonton, and I think I don't think Dallas Eagans necessarily deserve to be fired, but I think it's just what you do in the modern NHL when. Your team's not working out. Well, since 2009, no team in professional sports has changed coaches as much as the Edmonton Oilers. So, you gotta figure if you've changed the coach out six or seven times, it might not be the coaches. (laughs) Well, and not only that, but we had, so since 2009, so that was what, Pat Quinn and then Quinn and Rennie were co-coaches, I think. Yeah, McTavish, I think, was there. Then McTav- Well, Kevin Lowe was the coach in till 2000. Then I think McTavish was 2000 to 2009. Yeah, and then it was Quinn Pat and Quinn Rennie. and Rennie. And they were like co-coaches, weren't they? Yeah, and then they fired Quinn, and then they kept Rennie on, and then they fired him and brought other guys. And then it was Ralph Kruger yeah. for, what, one year? Yeah, it was, yeah. It was Kruger during the uh, lockout season. Yeah, okay. and he and was the only Dallas coach Eakins. that actually did anything. Yeah. Hey, they, they didn't and draft first. They drafted uh, seventh. So. Yeah. Cost them Sean Monaghan. Yep. <laughs> Thank and, you, uh, Kruger. And another centerman. And um, now they had Dallas Eakins, and now they're back to Craig McTavish. So maybe we'll just see this loop happen again. So you're saying that Kevin Lowe is the next coach of the Edmonton Oilers? <laughs> no, I, uh, well, obviously Pat Quinn can't be in there, but maybe they'll call Rennie back, and then after they fire him, they'll call Kruger and Eakins, and we'll just continue this cycle of coaches going through. Yeah, sure. Just keep them all under contract and, and you know, just bring them in as you need them. Either that, or we'll see the Oilers do what they love to, bring in their, uh, bring in their alumni, and in three months we'll see the Mark Messier's coach. Why not? Get uh, Kelly Buckberger in there as an assistant. And... Well, where's Paul Coffey these days? He's actually coaching somewhere, isn't he? Who knows? <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. I know he was coaching or was looking to get into coaching, so maybe they bring him in. Yeah. Well, hey, if they want alumni, maybe we can send them back Corey Potter and just say, oh, he can coach the team. <laughs> uh, I, I think that if I was the coach of the Oilers, I would need a lifetime supply of Wayne Gretzky Vineyard wine. <laughs> Well, <laughs> well, Sid Six Zero, uh, he was on a Twitter, and he has said that uh, if you had to choose between mumps and coaching the Oilers, which would you take? And he said the uh, he would take the mumps. <laughs> At least the mumps would be over in a couple weeks. <laughs> so yeah, it's not a good situation when you have pretty much everybody laughing at you. They really need to figure out something up well, there. They, they they have. Craig McTavish is the solve to all their problems. He's going to make a lot of dramatic moves as GM, remember? And now he's going to make epic moves as coach. Yeah, mm-hmm. bringing in Nikita Nikitin. Woo, that worked out well. That was a bold move. Yeah. He promised bold moves, boys. He's delivered so far, sort of. I think if I was the GM of another team, my fans asked, will you make bold moves? I'll say, well, if we go on the Edmonton scale, yes. I promise every move we make will be bold. Because <laughs> if, if Nikitin is a bold move, then anyone else could probably do anything good. You know, it's bad when I would actually prefer Derek England than Nikita Nikitin, let alone the fact that Nikitin's making almost twice as much. <laughs> there you go. Count your blessings, my friend. <laughs> As much as we don't like a certain player, we got to count our blessings and be happy for what we do have. Yep. Well, boys, any other topics you want to bring up this week? No, I'm good. Matt? No, I, I'm good. Interesting week of Flames hockey coming up then. We're coming on the off the five-game losing streak, and we've got the Rangers on Tuesday. We have a back-to-back against the Stars and the Canucks Friday, Saturday. And Monday, the Kings are in town. Do you guys think we're going to be continuing the losing streak, or do you think we can get some W's here? Uh, Let's go around the table with our predictions, and let's do our guess first. Mike, what do you think? Okay, yeah, I think the losing streak will continue against the Rangers. They've been pretty hot lately. Um, I'm hoping we can beat Dallas, even though I have Letton in my fantasy pool. But, uh, yeah, it'd be nice to beat Dallas. You have to make a sacrifice. It would be especially nice to beat Vancouver. 
Um, but yeah, I, th- I think we lose to uh, LA for sure and the Rangers for sure. So, so eight points on the table. You're thinking we might come out with four. Yeah, I'm gonna be optimistic and say we w- we win that back to back Dallas Vancouver. What about you, Matt? Why not four for four? Gonna go on a hot streak. You think we're gonna get all eight points? Sure. Why not? You know. After facing the Oilers the other day, the Rangers only had to face 16 shots. So, you know, Lundqvist won't know what hit him tomorrow. (laughs) Wow, this is a heavy night. (laughs) Wow, actual players taking shots. Oh, no. (laughs) Did you guys see the interview with uh, Lundqvist? No. Yeah. Somebody asked him at the the, uh, shout-out against the Oilers if he had to make any, uh, you know, signature or difficult saves, and he just started laughing at the reporter. (laughs) I, I want I to see on YouTube. I, I bet yeah, someone put some I evil laughs in there. I think that's why Eakins got fired, was the goalie was laughing at them. That must be the new metric. If we can just get our goalies to laugh at every other coach, everyone will lose their job. Just tell Hiller. Any interview, just laugh. <laughs> um, I, I'm looking at the schedule. I think we're going to have a tough time against the Rangers. Um, I think coming off Chicago with one day in between, they're going to have a tough time. I think we can take Dallas. I'm not sure about Vancouver on the backside of that, but I actually think they might take LA. So I'm going to take, of the eight points available, I'm going to take two games that we win. I think we'll win Dallas and we'll win LA. So I think we're going to be 500 on the week. I take 500 on the week. I think from where we're at right now and the week we're coming off of, 500 on the week would be really nice. Yeah, absolutely. What about you, Matt? I'm still going four for four. All right, four for four for Matt. If if it's four for four, Matt, you're going to look like a genius. We can come back and rebound and beat all these teams. And then the only team we have, the week after is an easy week. We got the Kings on Monday, then we don't play again until Saturday, and we got the Oilers. Yeah. Excellent. And so, between Christmas and New Year's, we get a pair of games against Edmonton. There, That'll turn your season around right there. There you go. So if nothing else, if we have a rough week – we got two games against the Oilers in less than a week, so that's where we can turn around. We better not lose those two. Nope. Because if their goalie laughs at Hartley, he might be out of here. <laughs> yeah, we don't want that. We might have to hire Eakins then. Ah. We're not that bad. Well, actually, our guys know how to play defense, so maybe it would work out. Well, no, we don't want the swarm anywhere near us, please, no. <laughs> <laughs> Take him away with the City of Champions sign they're taking down. Far away from Calgary. Well, Mike, thanks for joining us tonight. Do you want to promote your Twitter or your website or anywhere that someone can find you if they're interested in learning more about you? Well, you know, I'm not normally into shameless self-promotion, but yeah, if you want to follow me, it's uh, at Mike underscore Crosby on Twitter. And for those that don't know, Mike is a student in the, what, the radio broadcast program at State? Yeah, so maybe you will hear me on the air one day. If you ever come to State Campus, you you might hear him. Um, they do the on-campus radio. You can also listen online. What's the website address? Radio.sate.ca is where you can listen to us. There you go. So listen to the State students. They're a great bunch there. Uh, got some great instructors, including a friend of the show, Beasley, who's one of the uh, instructors there. So if you're listening for something different, want to hear some between Fireside Chat and want some to listen to, tune in to State's radio station. Yeah. That would be great. We'd appreciate it. Thanks a lot, boys. And let's hope that Matt's right and we go eight points on the week. Here's hoping. Have a great week, everybody. Take care. Fireside Chat is edited by Mike Crosby and Brett Bauer. This show is licensed under Creative Commons license. For full license information, visit firesidechat.ca.